wonderful words of life. Let me honor the beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and beauty. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of love. Sinner leads to the loving call. Wonderful words of life, oh so freely given, owing hearts to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful. Wonderful words of love, <laughs> Jesus, Holy Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful. Happy Sabbath, church family. Really enjoyed that song. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. And that really is what we hope to do today, is to have, by God's grace, wonderful words of life. All right, the scripture reading was read um, from the book of Colossians, chapter 2, starting at verse 8. I'm going to read the scripture reading again. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, 
after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Our message this Sabbath, a continuation of our series on apologetics, is the mystery of the Godhead. The mystery of the Godhead. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Once again, Lord, I ask that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard today. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, a lot to cover today. So we're going to jump straight to the book of Acts, the sixth chapter. Acts chapter six. Um, I'm going to move quick. There's a lot of verses I want to share today. Um, but I want to start, as I always do, with a story that sets up our topic of the day. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, um, we get a picture of what the church was like um, when in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus um, introduces us to the church of Ephesus, prophetic church of Ephesus. This is what the church was like during apostolic times. Here's what the Bible says, Acts 6 and verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So the church was growing. In fact, they'd just chosen uh, disciple, uh, um, uh, deacons, and one of them was a man named Stephen. The Bible says in verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Stephen was a powerful young man. The Bible says in Acts 6 and verse 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So they began to challenge Stephen on his beliefs of this burgeoning new uh, religion, this, 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 this group they call those who follow the way. Christians, it began to challenge Stephen, but Stephen, the Bible says, was full of power. Look at this, verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. When they came for Stephen, now this is also kind of the setup for how Paul, then Saul, is introduced into ministry in a sense, but they could not deal with Stephen. This is why we are studying apologetics, because each of us, like Stephen, must be prepared to give an answer. Since we've been, since these sermons have come out, I've heard from people around the world, and one person in Australia who grew up in under Soviet um, uh, communist rule wrote me a thank you for the first two in the, in this series, and told me that as a child under communism, her family taught her what she believed, and she said many times when she went to school, the teachers would challenge her in the Soviet Union on what she believed. And she was, a, she knew, thing is deep, she knew the scriptures to defend her belief by heart. And she would answer the teachers. She, she wrote me and told me that in fact, some of those teachers would literally show up in church. Because as a child, she was able to give a defense. I believe there are Christians in the, Christians in the former Soviet Union today who are introduced to God by some of these children where their parents taught them the word of God and sent them to school. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If someone asks you why you believe in the Trinity, can you give an answer? Why you believe in a triune God? Or, like so many today, do you no longer believe this? 
And it's interesting, and I, well, I'm jumping ahead, but, but it was a time when the Trinity was, uh, was attacked most by people who did not believe the Bible and who did not believe in God. The truth of the matter is the divinity of Christ, the divinity of the Holy Spirit, is now just as attacked from inside the church. The story of Stephen continues. Acts chapter 6, verse 11. Then they suburned men, meaning they bribed them, they paid them, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So these men were liars. They, these weren't just regular snitches. These were lying snitches paid to come in and speak words against Stephen. He blasphemed against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. So they grab Stephen, they take him to the council, and they set up false witnesses, the Bible says in verse 13 of chapter 6 of the book of Acts. This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And the lies begin to, to ratchet up. But we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Their lives, and let me tell you something, when the time of trouble comes, and it has started, there are stories from all over the world, even Europe and North America, where Christians, because of what they believe, their religious beliefs, their doctrinal beliefs, are under fire. And shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. So they start, to, the, the lie begins to morph and grow, mutate, and expand. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of a what? Of an angel. Stephen was so imbued with the Holy Spirit, that when they looked on Stephen, he looked like an angel. Stephen then goes into a full history of the Jewish nation in Acts chapter 7, including their failures in idolatry, their desire during the time of Moses to go back to Egypt, their rejection and murder of prophets. He speaks of the wilderness tabernacle. It comes back to the sanctuary message, actually. And he speaks of the sanctuary, the tabernacle. And he talks about how David wanted to build a house for God. But that he was not allowed to, as the scripture teaches, as we know. But he says instead this, Acts chapter 7 and verse 47. But Solomon built him a house. Now, why is this relevant? Because the accusations against Stephen is that he is saying that Jesus is going to destroy the temple, that he's blaspheming against God and against the law and against Moses, and that finally, the final thing is, he's saying that this temple is going to be destroyed. And that is probably because he is quoting Christ, where Christ says, I leave your house unto you desolate. And so they're probably misconstruing what he said. Jesus never said he was going to come back and destroy the temple. But he said the temple was going to be left desolate. And in Matthew 24, Jesus gives the prophecies which tell us that 70 years later, the temple would be destroyed. And on cue prophetically, it was destroyed. But look at how Stephen's story changes. And I want you to see how the Trinity is embedded in what he says. Watch this. Howbeit the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. He says, listen, you built this temple. You're so tied to this temple. But God does not simply dwell in temples that men built, not even Solomon's temple. Now, remember, this was no longer Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. This was a rebuilt temple. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is this is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? God said, listen, I created the universe. Heaven is my throne. Earth is like a footstool. Here's where Stephen goes in here, though. Stephen, you can see Stephen was a, a, an unabashed, courageous man. He says, he's stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Now, that was a grave insult to people who cling to the idea that they were circumcised. For him to say, listen, you may be circumcised in one way, but you missed the most important type of circumcision. 
You do always resist the Holy Ghost, the first part of the Trinity. As your fathers did, so did ye. Which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one? The second part of the Trinity. Here's Jesus Christ, the just one, the Son of God, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and what? And have not kept it. Now watch this. And when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They were insulted. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. The translation is they gnashed their teeth to get at him. They became like brute beasts, church. So angry at Stephen's words of truth that they wanted to rip him to pieces. Look at verse 55. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. All three parts of the Godhead represented here. He is filled with the Holy Ghost. The work of the Holy Ghost at this time was on earth. Remember, Jesus gave the comfort of the Holy Ghost. So here he is working in Stephen so that Stephen, at the time of his death, could look to heaven and see the other two parts of the Trinity. He could look to heaven and see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, behold, I see the heavens open. He said this out loud. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The Son of Man who you rejected, crucified and destroyed, I see him standing on the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They, they were in unity in their attack against him. And cast him out of the city. They pick him up, bring him, throw him outside of the city. The Bible says, and they stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul witnessed this whole thing. This is why when you hear the apostle Paul speak later on, he says that he is the chief among sinners. Acts 7 and verse 59, and they stoned Stephen. Stephen was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Here is the first martyr of the Christian church. Who even at his death, he sounds like Christ on the cross. Where Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was so full of the spirit of the living God that Stephen was died not angry with his murderers. Spirit of Prophecy, Manuscript 17, 1885 says Stephen was the first Christian martyr. Stephen was full of faith and power. The enemies of God and, and the truth felt stirred with hatred and opposition. Satan... Uh, Satan um, impel them to resist the truth. Stephen had to meet an argument, in argument, the most artful, deceptive uh, disputant, hoping to confuse and put down his arguments. He must be able to give an answer. If Stephen had not searched the scriptures and himself become fortified with the evidence of God's word, he could not have borne the test. But he knew the foundation of his faith was firm and he was ready to answer his opponents. Stephen came off victorious. He spoke with assurance and wisdom and power that astonished and confounded the enemies of truth. When they found themselves baffled and defeated at every attempt, then they were bent on his destruction. Had these professedly honest and wise men been really seeking for the truth, they would have admitted evidence which they could not controvert. They would have acknowledged their error and yielded to the convincing arguments of truth, and been on the Lord's side and on the side of truth. But such was not their purpose nor character. Look at this last part. They hated Christ. They hated all of his followers, and they put Stephen to death. Let me tell you something. I, I say this all the time. You will not stand the test of coming persecution if you do not know what you believe and why you believe it. You simply will not. No one is going to be tortured for something they don't understand and don't fully believe. 
When they start torturing you and they start questioning you about our truths and you're like, you know what, I'm not even sure about that thing. You're going to lose your job for something you're not sure about? We speak of the Godhead Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is, of course, one of the most difficult things in Christianity. There are a lot of reasons people don't like this. And we're going to go through it and give some scripture uh, to, to, to try and better understand it. It's something that even myself, it's something you, you wrestle with. It's because you have to study it. You gotta, it's got to be based on God's word that you believe it. There's a lot of reasons people don't believe it. What? What are the challenges? Well, one, the word does not appear in Scripture. Some people say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Some say it is a Catholic invention. So now that's why you have many Adventists who, in their, in their desire to come out of Babylon, wind up coming out of the truth. Oh, well, y'all missing this thing. Because you got to keep going further and further and further away until finally you start to leave the realm of Scripture. The word does not appear in scripture. Somebody say, well, that's, I, can't, I can't believe it. A word not appearing in scripture doesn't mean that the concept that the word represents doesn't appear in scripture, which we'll show you. It seems to be an inherent conflict that God is one and yet three, and we'll talk more about that in a second. It is attacked by atheists and other religions. Muslims, for, uh, for example, really do not like this idea of the Trinity. In fact, when people say Allah and Jehovah are the same God, one of the reasons I know they cannot be the same God is Allah defines himself as one who has no partners and no sons. So he can't be, this can't be, that can't be the same God. It's an ignored doctrine, and many claim it is of pagan origin. And so they go back to, this is Horus, Isis, and Osiris, um, and they say this was a trinity, and they go back and they look at all the, the three different gods, usually a father, a, son, a mother, and a son, and they say this is the trinity, and it is nothing like it. These are each separate deities with separate powers and separate realms of influence, totally different from what we're going to study in the trinity. And, and remember that the devil understands God quite well. I'll show you a verse that says that. Do you not think that from the, when he deceived Adam and Eve in the garden, he did not immediately begin to set up counterfeit versions of God? Of course he did. I was like, well, they're, they're virgin births in ancient customs. You didn't think Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be born of a virgin? You don't think that Lucifer had enough sense to try and set up false versions of this before it ever happened? So the question of the Trinity so the doctrine of Trinity has been called the most puzzling doctrine in the Christian faith, right? And, and um, one of the, uh, somebody wrote and he said, um, if you try to explain the Trinity, you will lose your mind, but if you deny it, you might lose your soul. Is it an inscrutable puzzle or a central truth? What is it? Well, let's get into it. What the Trinity is not. First of all, Christians don't believe in three gods. That's a heresy called tritheism. It's not what we believe. We don't believe there are three gods that we worship. Nor do Christians believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three forms of God, like steam, water, and ice. That's the heresy called modalism, which means God is in different modes in each of these things, but, but, uh, but, but he's one God, right? So some people try and use ice, water, and steam as an analogy for the Trinity. It's, it's not a good analogy because God isn't like water. Like we have to deal with ice outside, you sprinkle the salt on it, it turns the water, it evaporates and becomes steam. It's one thing. Those are the same molecules. This is different. Also, we don't believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are parts or pieces of God. That would imply that Jesus is one-third God, the Father is a third God, and the Holy Spirit is one-third God. There's no mathematics or accounting for God being dissected up like a fraction. And so the word Trinity, or triune, or triunity, speaks to the fact that there are three in one. And this is a concept that is difficult, but we're going to get into the word of God to try and show it. So what does the Bible say? The first thing you have to understand if you're going to step into this is that the first principle is that there is only one God. That is not a wavering principle. And here are the verses, Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, 
and I am the last. And beside me there is what? There is no God. There's only one God. Deuteronomy 4.35, unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Deuteronomy 6.4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In the New Testament, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. James 2 and verse 19, thou believest that there is one God? You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. So there's only one God. The Bible is clear on that. So to really understand God, you've got to go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What does that mean? That means before God, there was nothing. So we talked about this a few weeks ago. Some people say, well, the law of cause and effect means that, if, that God then must have a cause. He, he couldn't just be an effect, but they don't understand. God is not an effect, so he has no cause. He pre-existed the world. In fact, he exists above time. That's why when God speaks of himself, he says, I am. Because he's always existed. In the beginning, God created Wow. So watch this. We know that there's only one God, but the Bible also speaks to a plurality of God. Look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, let us, us is plural, make man in our image. That is plural. After our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, singular. In the image of God, he created he him. Male and female created he them. Let us make man in our image. So God created man in his own image. Start to start to begin to understand the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is not totally revealed there. The Old Testament has the New Testament in it concealed. The New Testament has the Old Testament in it revealed. Once you start to understand that, the Bible begins to come alive. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The word there is Elohim. The noun Elohim is plural, but it is always used with a singular verb when it speaks of the true God. This indicates a unity and diversity within the nature of God. This unity and diversity is revealed in scripture as the doctrine of the Trinity. Not an, not an end in A-I-M, which is dual, but in I am, Elohim, I am, which is three or more. The very way it's set up, the way the word Elohim is there in the Hebrew, speaks to a plurality to God. Now, it does not by itself show to prove the Trinity, but it leaves you the space to, to keep studying the Trinity. And so you go to the other book of the Bible that begins in the beginning. That's the book of John. The book of John begins to give you the rest of the picture. There's a plurality to God. John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word what? Was God. He was with him, and he was him at the same time. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, this is speaking, of course, of Christ, as we're going to show you in a second, Nothing was made that Jesus didn't make. And he was with God in the beginning. And he was God from the beginning. Now, we'll, get back, we'll come back to John 1. But I tell you that this all by itself shows you that when the Bible wrote, when Moses wrote Genesis 1 and verse 1 and spoke of Elohim, here you begin to get the Bible expanding on that concept. So we go from here to show you that there are three in the Bible who are called God or given divine treatment. Philippians 1 and verse 2, God the Father is the first one. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Most people don't argue that God the Father is God. It's the one that they accept, but I'll show you the verses anyway. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Ephesians 4, 6. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. 
God the Father is God. Amen? It gets difficult for people when you jump to the next one, that Jesus is also divine. He is God. We just read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I like John 1 in verse 10. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world, what? Knew him not. So since the world knew him not, look at what he does. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and did what? And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was a divinity wrapped up in humanity. 100% God, 100% man. We may have to have a whole separate uh, sermon on just the nature of Christ. but, But here you see it. The word was made flesh. The word that was there in the beginning. God the Son, Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. John 8.58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Listen, when he said that, they were ready to kill him. Before Abraham, they said, how do you know? You couldn't, you're not old enough to know Abraham. That's what they said to him. He said, before Abraham was, I am. This is the same I am that Moses heard the bush from the bush before he went into Egypt. Moses said, who should I say sent me? God from out of the bush says, tell him, tell him I am. <laughs> Gets deeper. So I know you guys are studying Hebrews for the Sabbath school lesson. Let's look at what Hebrews says about this. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. How did God make the worlds? By his Son. So Jesus is creator. This is the second verse that tells you that. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, this speaks to the nature of the, of the Godhead, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had, made, he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He said, Paul saying, which angel did God say that to? And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten uh, into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God do what? Worship him. So So some people say, well, the fact that the Bible says that Jesus was begotten means that Jesus was created, so he can't really be God. But what they don't understand is that there are two natures to Christ. The part of Christ that was begotten is the part that put on flesh. It was begotten in a manger in Bethlehem. But the part of Christ that is divine before Abraham existed. Ah. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and ministers of flames of fire? Verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith. This is what God says to the Son. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. God speaks to Jesus and says, O God, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now watch this. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Christ is God. John 28 and verse 27. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my what? And my God. Jesus said unto Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Here's the promise to each one of you. Blessed are they that have, they, that have not seen, and yet have what? And yet have believed. There's a power in believing this truth without having the opportunity Thomas had to run his hands into the scars of Christ's hands or touch the the, 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 the pierced side of Jesus. There's a blessing in believing this. 
All right, a few more verses. The blind man worshipped him at his healing, right? And he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Tell us so that we may believe in him. Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he did what? He worshipped him. Would Jesus accept worship if he wasn't God? What happened in Revelation when the angel, when, they, when John fell before the angel to worship him? He said, hey, don't do it. I'm your fellow servant. You can't worship me. When they tried to worship the apostles, when they did great works in the book of Acts, the apostles said, hey, 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 don't worship us. Worship God. Isn't it interesting? Jesus accepts worship, which means he is divine. There's other places. The woman worshiped him at the empty tomb, right? So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus uh, met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. They worshiped him. The disciples worshipped him at the ascension. Uh, the, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they did what? They worshipped him. He, he, he can't receive worship if he's not God. But here's how deep it is. You might say, well, they worshipped him because of the miracles he did, because of the work he did on earth. But you've got to go back to Matthew 2, 10 through 12. It says, when the wise men came into the house, they saw the child with Mary, and they bowed down and did what? They worshiped Jesus when he was just a baby. Why would the wise men do that? Because they understood the scripture. That's why. For unto us, Isaiah 9, 6, is Jesus God? For unto us a child is born. This is what the, I believe those, the, 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 the wise men read. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful. Counselor. What's his name? The mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He was God when he was in the manger. In fact, this is why we are told that when Lucifer saw him there, when Satan saw him in the manger, surrounded by smelly animals, even fallen Lucifer was in awe. That one who had once been so high would come so low. Spirit of Prophecy says this, the Review and Herald, April 5th, 1906, says the world was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If Christ made all things, he existed before all things. The words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need be left in doubt. Christ was God essentially. Don't miss this, church. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity. God over all, blessed forevermore. The other one that people have a problem with is this one. God, the Holy Spirit. A lot of folk can't get this one. And they don't realize that literally to deny the divinity of Christ is the spirit of Antichrist. To deny the Holy Spirit is to open yourself up for the last day deceptions. And I'm going to show you why here in a second. But when you deny the divinity and person of the Holy Spirit, you set yourself up for last day deception. Is the Holy Spirit God? Acts 5, 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you thou conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men. Who did he lie to? But unto God. There are two, two times in these two passages that someone is lied to. He lied to the Holy Ghost and he lied to God. If I, could, if I could do the algebra, I'd show you that by lying, by, by, Paul, by Luke stating that they lied, to, that this lie was to the Holy Ghost and to God, it tells you that the Holy Ghost is God. You can't lie to a force. You can't lie to gravity. A lot of people think of the Holy Spirit as some kind of force, like Star Wars, right? Now, you, can just, I, you got the force. I don't have the force. If I had more of the force, I could do all kinds of stuff. I can... Heal people, shama lama lama, hit them over the head and they fall out. You've lied to God. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. 
this is powerful. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. To deny the Holy Spirit its divinity is blasphemy. And it will not be forgiven. Watch this. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. You walk on dangerous ground when you begin to question the divinity and the personhood of the Holy Spirit. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Acts 28, 25, when they agreed not among themselves, this is the personhood of the Holy Spirit, they departed after that. Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers. The Holy Spirit speaks. Spoke in the Old Testament through Isaiah. Acts 13, 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, who said it? The Holy Ghost said it. The, the force doesn't speak. The Holy Ghost speaks. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Isaiah 63, 10, but they rebelled. And they did what? They vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Notice they described the Holy Spirit not as it, but as what? He, even in the Old Testament. Why? Because they rebelled and they vexed. They grieved the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was also at creation. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God did what? It moved upon the face of the waters. Do you now see that? In the beginning, God created. God the Father says he gave creative power to God the Son, who the Bible teaches us created all things. But in the presence of all of that, who else was there? God, the Holy Spirit, what was he doing? Moving on the waters. He was a part of the creative powers. SDA Bible commentary on Genesis chapter 1 says this. The Spirit of God moved. Spirit, ruach is the Hebrew for it, in harmony with scriptural usage. The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. From this place onward throughout the whole scripture, the Spirit of God has the role of the divine agent of God in all creative acts. Watch this. Whether of the earth, of nature, of the church, of the new life, or watch this, or of the new man. When you deny the Holy Spirit, you deny the part of God that works to transform your heart from one of stone to one of flesh. You deny the part of God that transforms the character and allows you, in fact, the Bible says that what part of the Godhead is it that seals, that gives the seal of the living God? The seal is done by the Holy Spirit. Evangelism, page 617, Spirit of Prophecy says the Holy Spirit has a personality, else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. We must also, he must also be a divine person. Else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? Watch this. So, even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. This is why the Bible says that when you receive the Holy Spirit, he would lead you into what? All truth. He is the part of God that has searched all of the divine nature. He understands all the truth. He is the part of God that plugs into humanity, connects, and I believe he connects right here in the frontal lobe of the brain. This is why Satan wants you drunk, high on weed, high on liquor. He wants you, you eating bad diets. He wants your mind clouded because then the Holy Spirit can't work in your mind the way he's supposed to. So here's the mystery of the Godhead. Number one, we said there's only one God. Number two, there is a plurality to the one God. And three are called God. God the Father is called God. God the Son is worshipped and called God. God the Holy Spirit is called God and has a personality. So what causes people to have a problem is this, the law of non-contradiction. It is a law from philosophy. In logic, and, and logic, in logic, the law of non-contradiction states that contradictory propositions cannot both be true. 
In the same sense, at the same time, example, the two propositions, P is the case and P is not the case, are mutually exclusive. And what people say is, well, you're saying that God is one, and then you're saying that God is three. The two things cannot be true. There are people who have um, walked away from Christianity, or vowed to never join Christianity, they say, because the fundamental tenet of Christianity, the Trinity, the triune God, violates the law of non-contradiction. What would you say to them? All right. One, it is a mystery. But here's what you would say. God is one in essence and three in person. He is one in essence and three in person. He is one in what and three in who. Three of them have the same essence. And essence isn't like we think of essence on the earth. Even person is not like we think of person. He is one in essence. They are one in being. But they are three in person. And what they mean by that, when they, when, 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 especially people like R.C. Sproul's writes about this, what they mean by that is they are one, they're different persons, meaning I, one can, God the Father can say I and speak to Jesus and say you, meaning that they're separate persons, not like we think of persons as humans, but they each have an I and they can call each other you. So they're distinct in who, but they are one in essence, in being. All right. Is the Trinity a contradiction? It is not a contradiction for God to both be three and one because he is not three and one in the same way. He is three in a different way than he is one. Thus, we are not speaking with a forked tongue. We are not saying that God is one and then denying that he is one by saying that he is three. This is very important. God is one and three at the same time, but not in the same way. How is God one? He is one in essence. How is God three? He is three in person. Essence and person are not the same thing. God is one in a certain way, essence, and three in a different way, person. Since God is one in a different way than he is three, the Trinity is not a contradiction. There would only be a contradiction if we said that God is three in the same way that he is one. If we said God is one in essence and God is three in essence, or God is one in person and three in person, there'd be a contradiction. But God is one in essence and three in person. And as we go through the rest of these verses, you're going to see how that plays out. Isaiah 48, verse 12, hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. That's speaking of who? Jesus, right? Jesus says in, in, in Revelation 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. My hand also, this is Jesus speaking now, my hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spawned the heavens. When I called unto them, they stand up together. Who created? We've already established it. Jesus created. So who's speaking? Jesus. He said, listen, I laid the foundation of the earth. His right hand spawned the heavens. Let me tell you, you know who you, do you know the Jesus we worship? His right hand spawned the heavens, spanned the heavens. He says, when I call unto them, they stand up together. He speaks the word, and the universe comes into order. That's the God we serve. Look how the verse continues. It speaks to the Trinity in the Old Testament. Isaiah 48, 16, Jesus still speaking. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. There am I, God the Son, and now the Lord God. God the Father, and his spirit, God the Holy Spirit, hath sent me. And, the, and what's in parentheses there, God the Father, as I added. But you can go back and look at it, read it in the Amplified Version. You'll find it a pretty compelling scripture. Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Why would you baptize in the name of one of them if one of them isn't divine? For there are three that bear record in heaven. John 5, 7 really makes this thing clear. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are what? One. They are one in essence, but three in person. Signs of the Times, November 27, 1893, says the Jews had never heard such words from human lips. And a convicting influence attended them, for it seemed that divinity flashed through humanity, through humanity as Jesus said, I and my Father 
are one. The words of Christ were full of deep meaning as he put forth the claim that he and his father were one. That he and the father were one substance possessing the same attributes. One in essence. The spirit of prophecy is here. One in substance. One what? Three who's. What is the application of all of this? Number one, God is love. He was loved before anything was created. In fact, let us rejoice that the, in this triune God, right? Because the, the way salvation works, that when we were lost in sin, our God acted in every person of his being to save us, right? The Father gave the Son, John 3, 16. The Son offered himself on the cross, and the Holy Spirit brought us to Jesus. Each aspect works together to save us. It, we are so lost that every member of the Godhead had to work together for our salvation. God is love. God created to love us not because he needed us to love him. He created us to love us. That's why we say, why do I love him? Because he first loved me. Some would say, well, God created man because he was lonely. He wasn't lonely. Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed together. That's why he's loved, because he's always had someone to love. They've always been in a love relationship. Number three, all three persons of the Godhead were involved in our creation, and all are involved in our redemption. You see, at the climax of Jesus' suffering, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some Bible writers, some Bible commentators say this is strange. Jesus always prayed, and when he prayed to God, the Father, he prayed, Father. You know, you read the, the, the Gospels, he says, Father, Father, forgive them, Father this, Father that. But when the weight, don't miss this church, when the weight of the fullness of sin was laid on Christ, he did not cry out, Father. He said, My God, my God. It was God. It was the <laughs> sin created the, a rupture in the Trinity where God had to turn his back on his son. And in that moment, Jesus cries out from the depths, not just of his humanity, but of his divinity and says, my God, my God. It was God crying out to God. And it makes the plan of salvation make more sense because no man could have died and paid the cost for your sin. It was the eternal God who died on Calvary's tree. That's why he can pay the price for sin. He laid down his life, suffered abuse, spat upon, beaten, and whipped Clothes ripped off him, nailed to a cross. His blood as it fell provided for the forgiveness of sin. If you don't understand the Trinity properly, you can't really understand what happened at Calvary. Some of the other applications, the power of God in the third person, Sister White says, the prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. When you deny the Holy Spirit as God, you deny what God has given you to hold Satan in check. Our sanctification, signs of the time, June 19, 1901. Our sanctification is the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I was just saying this. It is the fulfillment of the covenant that God has made with those who bind themselves up with him to stand with him, with his Son, and with his Spirit in holy fellowship. Have you been born again? Have you become a new being in Christ Jesus? Then cooperate with the three great powers of heaven who are working in your behalf. Doing this, you will reveal to the world the principles of righteousness. Still seeking to give a true direction to her faith, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. In Christ, look at this church, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. 1 John 5, 12. The divinity, don't miss this, the divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. 
Did you get that? If he's not divine, then he couldn't have paid the price. His divinity is the assurance of our salvation. Spirit of Prophecy says in Great Controversy, page 524, if men reject the testimony of the inspired scriptures concerning the deity of Christ, it is in vain to argue the point with them. For no argument, however conclusive, could convince them. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 None who hold this error can have, true con- can have a true conception of the character or the mission of Christ, or of the great plan of God for man's redemption. Powerful stuff. In this age of the world, we see every grade. Signs of the Times, September 3rd, 1894. In this age of the world, we see every grade and degree of skepticism. They are rank infidels, who, those who believe in the lying wonders of spiritualism and those who reject the claims of divine truth. All these are placed among the class that John has written of and are controlled by the spirit of Antichrist. Ignorance of the character of God, pride of understanding, and the love of sin are the source of infidelity. Did you get that? Ignorance of the character of God. Men deny the divinity of Christ, cast away the Bible, and thus seek to free themselves from personal accountability to God. They bring the Bible into conflict with science falsely so-called. Remember we talked about this? The atheist says, you know, attacks the Christian and says, listen, going all the way back to uh, Marx and Engel and the founders of communism, they said, listen, the, the, the religion is the opiate of the masses. You know what the Christian responds and says? The reason the atheist runs from God is they want no accountability. They know one day they're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of the living God. So they work their whole lives to deny his existence. They bring the Bible into conflict with science falsely so called. These doubters can start inquiries which the most humble and pious Christian would be perplexed to know how to understand, how to answer. But because their queries cannot be answered is no evidence that the Bible is not true. A little child has asked questions in regard to God, the soul, and the future that the most learned could not answer. Ellen White finishes it this way. The truth of God's word will be revealed to those who are of a lowly heart, who will comprehend its duties and obey its precepts. It is pride of opinion that leads to skepticism and to the denial of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Skepticism has its origin in love of sin, love of ambition, and self-exaltation. Church, I'll finish with this. This is, a, this is a serious doctrine, one that I challenge you to go home and study for yourself, one that you need to understand. It's not just to understand it so you intellectually understand it. That's not enough. We must spiritually understand these doctrines. Meaning that the doctrine should create a change in our lives, that they should make us into new people, these doctrines. We should no longer be as we were, but we should be different in Christ Jesus. And unless we get there, church, we're in trouble. But what I, what I, what I, as, I as you read this, what I realize many of our people are struggling with is, is arrogance and arrogance of opinion. When you study the Godhead, you realize how humble Christ had to be to come to earth. That's why the Bible keeps saying he's meek and lowly. There is no such thing as an arrogant Christian. It's an oxymoron. It violates the law of non-contradiction. Because you can't be arrogant and Christian. Because by definition, the very uh, fiber of the Christian, the substance of the Christian, is humility. The desire to always be right, to win every argument. I have people coming at me all the time on uh, WhatsApp, always arguing with me. And sometimes I just say, and I'm like, this person could care less if they're right. I mean, if, they're, if, if it's the truth they're speaking. Well, they just want to be as right. This is about ego. And once ego comes in the mix, Satan gains control. 
When we study the Bible and study truth, we must be humble. Don't open your Bible to read it and don't ask first for the Spirit of God to lead you into truth and to remove arrogance and pride. These are heavy doctrines. But let me tell you something. The plan of salvation really only makes sense when you understand this doctrine, the way the Bible teaches it. And he, even more importantly, the, the concept of the Antichrist and that Satan is going to come as an angel of light. If Satan is only one, he's not a trinity. There's no, no, no plurality to Satan. So, of course, he wants to take that away from God. When he comes, as the scripture teaches, when Satan comes as an angel of light, because these doctrines have been destroyed, because people have stopped understanding and believing them, when he speaks the lies and claims divinity, folk will not have any way to understand that he is lying to them. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. I pray as we study apologetics, we are driven to study God's word in fullness and to understand it as complete truth. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study this doctrine, study your word. I pray, Lord, that we would now, when we pray, Lord, I pray that this enhances our prayer. That we know that there are three who are working on our behalf. One God, God the Father, who is overseeing all. Christ Jesus, who is mediating on our behalf. And the Holy Spirit, who takes our prayers and presents them before the throne of the living God. Father God, help us to know you more and completely. Help us, Lord, to have your character. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Closing hymn is hymn number 279, Only Trust Him. Please stand as we sing 279.
remain standing for the benediction. Father God, we ask now that as we leave this place, we never leave your presence. Lord, I ask in a special way, as we go into this next week and as the Sabbath closes later today, that we go into this week under the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God, help us to recognize the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross this week. And Father God, help us to be committed to studying your truths so that, Lord, we might be soldiers in the army of the living God who are worth their hire. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.